Um, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to offer a few thoughts from the UK on our experience uh, of public financial management. I should start by saying I think the, the book is incredibly valuable. Uh, really welcome it. It is, you know, it is something that we in the UK really benefit from these kind of international interactions. We're not necessarily the the best people. At doing it, but when we do do it, it, it is incredibly uh, <coughs> useful. And I think it is a good time uh, to kind of pause and think about uh, these things as, as we start to move out of some of the worst kind of acute phase of the, of the crisis into more of a kind of chronic uh, public financial management challenge with high levels of debt. Uh, it is a good time to be thinking about these things. And in the UK, we've launched a review of our financial management systems on the back of the spending round we completed in the in the summer, and I'm sure that people will be pouring through the book for uh, for thoughts from that. Um, and I also wanted to pick up one point that is in the in the opening chapter that I think is quite interesting in terms of the kind of the multidisciplinary nature of this, the complexity that that uh, Marco talked about, uh, and also the fact that in a sense it's not really a, a subject that is widely taught. So I'm I'm pleased to find myself sitting next to somebody who does teach it. It's certainly something that we <coughs> experience that. You know, we find that, for example, you get you know people with accountancy backgrounds, but may find the politics quite difficult to understand. You get a lot of economists, but economists are not very good at balance sheet questions, and it's something that you know I'm an economist that uh, we need to learn about. You get lots of policymakers, but policymakers are not necessarily that good at numbers. Uh, and actually, it is just a very kind of complicated, multidisciplinary subject. And I hope that. Uh, looking at it in that lens will help promote more teaching and understanding of it. At the moment, we have to do a lot of it in house, and it would be nice to you know, have more uh, kind of available outside. Um, I think also I would really emphasise the point that Marco made, and it's in the title about the kind of the emerging architecture. It's very much the UK experience that our systems and processes are, you know, they're evolutionary. They've taken a long time to get in place, and it is an architecture. It is not just a kind of set of things that you take off the shelf. They have to interact. The way they interact is very context specific, uh, and you know the way that things, the things that have worked and not worked in the UK, I think, depend much on their interaction with one another as well as a kind of freestanding uh, element. And the interactions are really important to understand. Um, I want to talk just very briefly a little bit about a big picture and then a little bit about some of the kind of specific reforms that I think are, have developed in the UK over the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, and just focus on uh, very quickly on three that I think have been particularly successful or interesting. On the big picture, I would, uh, I, I would point to three things that I think have proved really important in the UK context through the crisis, which are flexibility, credibility and transparency. Uh, and I think they have all kind of interacted. You know, we entered the financial crisis with public finances essentially premised on enduring growth uh, and therefore ended up with a very large deficit, one of the largest deficits in the, in the world, uh, when it turned out that the UK was a lot poorer than we had thought we were when we set those plans out. And it was really that that kind of hit the public finances much more than, say, the cost of fiscal stimulus, which was quite small, or even the, the direct costs of the financial interventions. Uh, it was really the mismatch between the size of the economy that we had and the size of the economy that we thought we had. Uh, and you know, the government's fiscal rules that have been in operation for about 10 years or so just kind of fell apart the moment the crisis mm. hit. Uh, and there were various attempts to kind of put new ones in place, most of which didn't last very long. Uh, a new government came in, set out its fiscal plan, uh, introduced a fiscal council, the Office for Budget Responsibility, but then also has faced a series of kind of subsequent shocks that weren't really anticipated in 2010, the Eurozone crisis, our major trading partner, uh, and commodity <coughs> price shocks. I mean, we've seen the price of oil in sterling terms uh, increase proportionally as much as it did in the 1970s oil shocks. Now, the UK is less dependent on oil, it's not, but it's a, a, a big shock, not much talked about. So flexibility has been really important in, in kind of seeing our way through, and you were never going to manage a kind of rigid framework through this. 
But flexibility is only possible, and we've only been able to have that flexibility in the UK because we have credibility. And I think this is, you know, credibility and flexibility go hand in hand. And if you want to be flexible and be able to respond effectively, you've got to be, you've got to be credible, and particularly if you're going to borrow a lot of, a lot of money, as we are still doing, uh, and certainly have been. And I think that comes down to the credibility of our institutions. The UK has a good track record of having consolidated in the past. I mean, that also shows that we have a bad track record of having lost control of our public finances in the past. Uh, but at least when we do, you know, we, we have a track record. But I think it also comes down, again, echoing Mark's point about institutions, the credibility of our institutions and the creation of the Office for Budget Responsibility meant that people could have confidence uh, that, you know, the forecasts were reflecting the knowledge as it was. The OBR, and they're the first to say it, of course, have no special insight. They're forecasting of the economy. Uh, does not have some kind of magic power that other forecasters do, although their, their public finance forecasts, of course, have access to a lot more information and have been a lot more accurate uh, than most public finance forecasts. But, you know, they have that credibility. They're, they're politically neutral, uh, and people can, can kind of put faith in that. Um, and I think also, you know, in a sense, the credibility of the, of the plan the government set out over multiple years, what it was going to do to bring down the deficit, and I stuck to that. Uh, and I think, you know, that consistency of sticking to the plan uh, has been very important for credibility. And, you know, it, we have been very uh, cautious when people have come along and said, well, you should, you know, you should add 10 billion here or change 10 billion there in a, you know, a one and a half trillion pound economy. And so, well, actually, the consistency of the plan is really what is important. And uh, we think that credibility is, is worth keeping. Um, and of course, there's political credibility as a civil servant. I probably shouldn't talk too much about it, but it's clearly a kind of essential thing uh, in, in any country. But I think that credibility itself then rests on transparency. Uh, you know, if you want to be credible, you've got to kind of put all the information out there. Uh, you know, British governments have been doing this for a number of years, but the OBR has also been a fantastic innovation in this, and that's not something that we initially foresaw, but the OBR have just published vast amounts of information about their forecast, how it's constructed in a way that the British government never did about our forecasts. And I think they have been a major innovation in, in the transparency space as well as credibility, and these all interact. Uh, but I think also that, you know, once you put the information out there, it allows other people to scrutinize you, and it comes back to this, you know, do you actually know what is going on? point the market said, you know, one of the best ways of finding out what is going on is put the information out there and allow other people to challenge you and have people, you know, institutions like the OBR, uh, but also, you know, civil society institutions whose, whose job it is and the legislature to challenge you. And then you find out the things that you don't know because somebody points them out to you. Um, right, very briefly, because I suspect I'm running out of my no. five, That's five right. minutes. I want to talk about uh, three particular kind of innovations over the last 30 or so years. and, and how they've gone on, which are, these are all things that I think have been successful. Um, so firstly, top-down budgeting. Uh, so until about 1993, the UK budget was basically put together from the bottom. You know, we negotiated, Treasury negotiated with departments over how much they wanted to spend, and we had an idea of how much we wanted to all add up to. But in the end, what it added up to was kind of where we got to in our negotiations. And it sounds like uh, this was a big problem in the kind of Greek uh, things where, you know, you lose 3% just in those negotiations. Uh, and this was a feat, you know, this system of doing things, which we'd had for many years, was undoubtedly one of the reasons why we kind of lost control of public finances in the early, in the early 90s and in previous crises. And in 1993, we just changed the system and we said, we're going to set an envelope top down, and then the negotiations are a zero sum game, and everything has to fit within that envelope. Uh, and at the time, it was a big innovation. Now, it's, it's impossible to imagine doing it the other way around. Uh, but it, you know, we have continued with this. It's been incredibly successful, uh, and you know, we, you know, when, in 2010, for example, when the government ran the big spending review, I was the, the SRO for that. You know, we set the envelope first, and we made it add up, and it forced a lot of decisions, and it was quite difficult. But you know, there was never a question of is it going to add back to the amount that we've determined. The system just ensured that. Um, the medium-term budgeting framework. I mean, I need to talk about this because it. It's a, it's a kind of critical thing, and Marco Rella teed me up for it. So uh, I think actually this has taken us like 50 years, not 30 years to go. <laughs> you know, in the 1960s, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a thing called the Plowden Commission, and it set up the system of kind of spending reviews. And it was it, the original idea was that this was going to happen over a three to four year window, and it would allow longer term planning, and it would be good for efficiency. 
actually what happened was every year you reran the system and you set it for four years and the consequences of that was that actually only everybody only took the first year seriously mm -hmm. and they you had these plans for multi years and it was all nicely set out and you could read about it but it didn't really make any have any traction on the real world whatsoever <laughs> Uh, and I think, you know, again, it echoes some of the themes about, you know, whether the thing really works or whether you're just saying you're doing it. Um, I think, you know, it was a particular experience of the 90s consolidation mm -hmm. that, you know, we ended up cutting a lot of things that could be cut quickly because the system was quite annual and therefore you needed stuff that in a sense you could save money the following year. And that wasn't necessarily the stuff that was that was the best things to cut. And I think there's a general recognition that in particular that, you know, we cut a lot of productive investment spending in the 90s because it was quick to cut but actually in the long run we kind of uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't the optimal decision um so the the labor government that came in in 1997 brought in a system a, a real system of medium-term budgets for about half of public expenditure uh so basically what we think of as as, as dell departmental expenditure so health education defense yeah. overseas development but not the benefit system uh, which of course is about a third of spending in its own right, debt interest, and some other kind of volatile, difficult to forecast elements which are still done annually. Um, that system I think has worked pretty well. Uh, it's still a kind of work in progress. We're now looking at how we can extend it to some other areas and people may have read about the idea of kind of capping the welfare budget and trying to bring that into this system of more controlled spending as a, as a further iteration and other countries like Sweden and the, the Netherlands are kind of ahead of us on this. Uh, but by setting those fixed multi-year budgets we have I think changed incentives within departments, departments feel much more ownership of their budgets because they're not coming back every year and negotiating. It's changed what people do for a living in public financial management in the you're not spending every year negotiating so you spend more time actually managing the money and that has been effective and I think you know it has helped this time in the consolidation for people to be able to think about reductions in costs that take a number of years to work through but are actually better changes to make and I think it has been a key thing in allowing us to, to drive more efficiency out of public spending this time round because things that take a number of years to do are possible and work in the system I think it is it it has helped, and certainly so far, departments have been very good at sticking within those budgets. There's a little bit of flexibility in them. We've we've, we've moved some up and some down, but but pretty much at the margins. Finally, um, a, a kind of a new one from Spending Review 2010, and one under this government that I think uh, is still work in progress. In a sense, we'll see whether it survives. Um, but for capital expenditure, and this is a lot easier on capital expenditure than resources. Why we tried it there. Uh, we took a completely different approach in SR 2010 to how we allocated it. And we basically went to, to the spending ministries and we said, give us a list of everything you want to spend money on, all your projects, and give us a, a, a fully compliant kind of cost-benefit analysis of the net present value of that project. Uh, and then we stuck them all in a giant spreadsheet, it was about 300 items long, and ranked them by the net present value per pound of capital expenditure. And we presented this to ministers and said, here is everything that people want. Here is how much money you've got. If you draw a line at how much money, this is what's above the line and this is what's below the line. And you can now go away and change things because your ministers and use dem democracy, but this is what it looks like. Uh, and this is what they teach you on public economics 101. It's only what they taught me is how it should be done. But we'd never done it before. I'm not aware that anybody else had ever done it before. And we actually went out and did it. On. It's easier on capital, of course, because you you don't have ongoing expenditure in the same way that you have on resource. So it'd be very difficult to on resource, although it's interesting to see if we can. Um, and we did it again in the last spending review. And I think one of the consequences of this is that even though you know, our expenditure is coming down quite sharply, the government is spending more money over the four years of SR10 on transport infrastructure, which is the biggest kind of capital shortfall in the UK, I think, on most people's analysis, and it's been in the previous four years when the spending was going up and up and up and was kind of record highs. Um, because, you know, massive reallocations within the, within the portfolio were possible, and it plays to some of the points about efficiency and how you manage that in a world where you're really focused on the numbers. Um, and, you know, we think that has worked very well. But it's, it's you know, we've only done it twice, and we'll see whether it, whether it lasts. Um, but I think what do all these things have in common is my final thought. I think, you know, they change the default. They change the way you think. Ultimately, the decisions, of course, are still made by the same people, and they can still make whatever decision they want. But these reforms help you think about the problem in a different way. They change the way the problem is framed, and I think that helps people to kind of reach um, more effective decisions. 
Thank you.